inspiring interviews with today's top landlords. This is the Rental Income Podcast. And now, Dan Lane. I'm sure you've seen it all over the news. A few weeks ago, Congress passed tax reform. And this new tax law directly impacts real estate. A lot has changed with the way that real estate is treated tax-wise. So I wanted to bring on a CPA today to talk about the changes so we can figure out what's changed and then see how we can best position ourselves to benefit from the new tax law. Joining us today is Sean McNamara. You may remember his name. He's been on the podcast before. He's a CPA and he works with a lot of rental property owners. So he spent a lot of time figuring this stuff out and he's got some great information to share with us today. So let's get into it. But first, we need to take a real quick break. We'll get a word in from our sponsor. We'll come back in 30 seconds and we'll talk to Sean. Are you having a hard time finding great investment properties? Unfortunately, the best deals are rarely found locally. Successful investing begins with the right properties in the right markets. Norada Real Estate provides everything you need to invest in the best deals across the U.S. Our simple, proven system will help you create real wealth and passive monthly cash flow. Get your free copy of the ultimate guide to passive real estate investing at noradarealestate.com slash guide. That's N-O-R-A-D-A realestate.com slash guide. Well, let's let's walk through some of the things that didn't change, because I, I know as as this legislation was being proposed, there were uh, they were talking about a lot of things and some of the things didn't make it into the final bill. So the, the first one and, and tell me if I'm wrong here, because you're definitely the expert in this. But the first one is the exemption for a primary residence, which I, I think this is one of the greatest tax loopholes out there. I've definitely taken advantage of this. But if you own a house and you live there for two out of the last five years, when you sell the property, your first $250,000 is tax free. Or if you're married, 500000 is tax free. Now, they were planning on on changing that for two out of the last five years to five out of the last eight years. But right. that didn't make the final bill, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. So there was a proposal to, to actually extend uh, the requirements there, as you mentioned, to, to the five and the eight. Uh, that did not make it. So it's, it's the Section 121 exemption. Like you said, uh, that's still in there. So for your primary residence, as long as you've lived there for two out of the previous five years, you can sell that property and you do not have to pick up any capital gains on the on the sale of that property, uh, assuming that the capital gains is less than uh, 250000 or 500000 Yeah, that is a, a great, great benefit. So I, I'm, I'm happy to hear that that wasn't changed. Um, yeah, it, it's a it's a wonderful tool. The uh, if you're willing to move every couple of years uh, from one house to another, you know you can essentially uh, climb the property ladder mm-hmm. individually and and not have to pay any uh, capital gains tax along the way. Absolutely. Um, there was also talk of changing the amount of time that depreciation is calculated. They were going to lower that. Uh, but that that also didn't make it into the final bill, right? So depreciation schedules are the same. Correct. So the right um, for for residential rental property, you have to capitalize and then write off the uh, the value of the property over twenty seven and a half years. And then for commercial property, it's thirty nine years. They were talking about bringing that down to twenty five years, I believe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, but that didn't that didn't make it. So, okay. we're, so we're still stuck with depreciating at twenty seven and a half. So I mean years. that would have been a huge benefit for rental owners of, of residential and a huge benefit to commercial owners. But as of right now, nothing's nothing's changing with that. So right, okay. yeah, unfortunately. Okay, and then some of the things that that have changed um, is the seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar mortgage limit. Um, for your primary house, right? So, so it used to be that you could write off up to a million dollars, and now it's seven hundred and fifty is the limit. Correct, um, correct. Okay. So, uh, you used to be able to claim uh, an interest deduction on a, a mortgage balance up to a million dollars, 
And you could actually even uh, have another $100,000 HELOC home equity line of credit on top of that. Um, and so they've, they've, they've capped that and they brought it down to, they were actually proposing bringing it even lower. I think it was down to 500,000 mm-hmm. and then, right. uh, you know, politics and there's compromise. So they, they met in the middle and, um, they're at, it's at 750,000. Okay. So you can still deduct mortgage interest on a mortgage balance, uh, up to 750,000. Okay. And then state and local taxes, that's now a $10,000 deduction. So that's your property taxes and any income tax you may have for your state, you're able to deduct up to $10,000. Right. So prior to this bill, you could uh for for your primary residence, um you could itemize on your individual income tax return. And you could claim any uh, state and local taxes, or uh, you know, as we like to call it, SALT. Uh, and so this is uh, real estate taxes and income taxes that you pay in in your state. You could deduct those on your federal return uh, and not have to pay tax on on those amounts. Um, in through this bill, what they've done is they've they've ultimately capped the the state and local tax, the SALT deduction to ten thousand dollars. So. It'll be interesting to see how this all plays out. Um, I, I'm in upstate New York, and New York is a you know notorious for high uh, taxes, the income taxes, and property taxes. And so, uh, how this how this plays out with you know will will people ultimately look to establish residency in lower income tax states? Um, and, and what that ultimately does to real estate markets will, uh, will be intriguing to, yeah. to monitor. Yeah. Um, it's definitely going to have an effect on, on a lot of markets. So yeah, we'll have to see how that, how that all plays out. But I guess the good news for rental property owners is that those deductions don't change for us, right? So we're not limited correct. in how much interest or property tax we can write Correct. Off. If, if you record, uh, all property taxes recorded on your Schedule E are still deductible in full. Uh, it's only uh, the this limitation only applies to individuals and their primary residence. So okay. it's, it's your your personal home, and um, it's what you it's if you were to itemize your tax return uh, as opposed to taking the standard deduction and. Um, that's where you would you'd be faced with the ten thousand dollar cap. So just to make sure everyone is clear on that, so if you have a primary residence, you're limited to seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars for your mortgage balance. But for rental properties, you could have twenty million dollars in mortgage interest, uh, or twenty million dollars in property value or mortgage interest, and there's no change there. Right. That's, Correct. That's, right. That's, it's considered a business venture. Uh, it's a business expense. And it's okay. Still, now, still what about deductible. for the HELOC? So you mentioned that for a home equity line of credit, that's not deductible anymore. We've had a lot of people on the podcast that have used their home equity line of credit to buy a rental property. Now, how, how does that work? Is, is that still possible to write off interest on your HELOC? If you're using it for business purposes, well, um, it depends on on what the HELOC is drawn on. So, uh, you know, are you taking this HELOC? I want to interrupt the interview real quick because Sean is about to give out some wrong information, and it's really important to me that we get this right. So, when we recorded this interview, Sean was under the impression that you could not use a line of credit on your primary house to buy a rental property. After we finished the interview, he looked it up, and it turns out that you can use a line of credit that you have on your personal house to either buy a rental property outright or use as a down payment or use to repair a rental property. So, that's kind of a a fine point. That, that I think is important to, to point out that if you use a line of credit on your house to buy a car or go on vacation or pay off credit cards or any other personal purpose, that money is not deductible. But if you use that money to buy a rental property 
or do something related to a rental property, that money is deductible. So I, I think this is a really good thing. I'm, I'm really happy to hear that they didn't take this away from us because we've had a lot of people on the show that have used this strategy to, to buy rental properties and, and to run their business. So I, I'm really happy that, that that benefit is staying. Coming up on the Rental Income Podcast. There's a couple of new tax breaks that we get as rental property owners, and there's also some tax breaks you get if you own your properties in an LLC. So we're going to get into that here in just a second. But first, I want to welcome a brand new sponsor to the podcast. It's MyLandlordHelper.com. I am super excited to have them on as a sponsor. I think that they have a really awesome service that can really help you out. Let me give you an example of, of how their their service works. So th- I think a good way to explain it is they are basically a virtual property manager. So say I've got a tenant that has a leaking faucet. That tenant would call into my landlordhelper.com and the person they speak to would have a list of all of my service providers. So they would have my HVAC guy, my plumber, my electrician, my handyman. So they're going to say, okay, for for a a problem with a leaking faucet, that's probably something a handyman could handle. So they'll call my handyman and they'll coordinate with the tenant to get to get out there and to get that issue fixed. So I don't have to be involved at all with that. They can deal with rent collection. So they've got several different options that tenants can use to pay rent. So anytime that the tenant needs anything, any phone call, Anytime they're paying rent, I'm not involved at all. MyLandlordHelper.com is handling that remotely from their office. They can handle any kind of legal notices. So if my tenant doesn't pay, they can they can start the eviction process. They can help me with vacancies. They can get my properties listed. They can help with, with screenings. So there's so much that they can do, and they can do it all remotely. So I, I think this is definitely something that you should check out. As a rental property owner, they're offering a free 30-day trial if if you want to try out their service. But I I think once you try it out, you're going to be really happy with it. It, Just go to mylandlordhelper.com. That's mylandlordhelper.com. You can get more information about how it works, and you can sign up for the free 30-day trial. Again, that's mylandlordhelper.com. Let's get back to the interview. So, So can you tell me how... Oh, I guess like what they mean when they say pass through business, like it, does that mean LLC or does that mean something else? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, um, there's, there's really, there's three different types of businesses out there. There's a sole proprietorship, a, uh, a partnership and a corporation. Um, and so a, a corporation, uh, a C corp as it's commonly referred to is that is not a pass through entity. Uh, the corporation makes money, pays taxes, and then uh, pays dividends, and uh, the shareholders receive those dividends, and they also pay taxes on those dividends as well. So that's that's the downside to a C corporation. There's this double taxation for pass through entities, which is a uh, an S corp or a partnership. Um, what you do is uh, literally the the income passes through the business to the partner or uh, the shareholder of that business, and then they they recognize that income on their individual tax returns and and pay uh, pay at their ordinary income tax rates. So uh, with this new bill, they've they've cut the corporate rate down to twenty one percent from thirty five, and. Uh, Congress had the foresight to realize that doing this, they would probably incentivize a lot of pass-through entities uh, to start converting to C-corporation status. So uh, in order to do that, they've, they've also thrown a, a bone here to the, the pass-through entities by giving you a, a 20% deduction on, um, on pass-through income. Okay, so let me make sure I understand what what that means. So let's just say for your pass through, so that that's an LLC. So for your LLC, if you make a hundred thousand dollars, that first twenty thousand you don't pay any taxes on. So you're you're only taxed as if you had made eighty thousand. Is that right? Uh, the general, yeah, the 
The general answer of response would be yes. Okay. Uh, there are caveats to that. It, the income has to be quote unquote qualified business income, which is is not clearly defined at this point as as um, what we do know is that it would not uh, include capital gains or other uh, interest. Uh, um, it's basically you know the income that's generated from the you know the business um, in doing its its core. Uh, okay. business. So uh, in, in the case of, of our listeners owning rental properties, mm-hmm. would rental property be considered business income? If- From everything that I have, have researched, the answer is yes. Okay. okay. Um, that, uh, and that's, that would go from, you know, a schedule E filer to a partnership to, uh, to an S corp. Uh, yes. That, okay. uh, you so, know, um, so that I mean that that's a huge benefit. So twenty percent of your profit is basically tax free now. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's that, awesome. It, there there would be a deduction. How it's all going to flow through? I, we, we just don't know yet. Uh, there hasn't been any guidance issued, and then usually the forms, uh, the actual forms, you know, that we use to file, they those won't come out until the fall of, of 2018. Um, so yeah, how the numbers all flow, uh, remains to be seen. It's something we'll, we'll discover, um, sometime this year, later this year. Now, what happens um, if somebody owns properties personally? So not everybody has an LLC for their rentals. If someone owns a property personally, should mm-hmm. they move it to an LLC or can they get this deduction by owning it personally, yeah. From from everything that I've seen, it, you know, it's uh, it would be qualified business income if it's just on your Schedule E, okay, and it's not held in an LLC. Um, you, you know, placing property in an LLC isn't uh, isn't a horrible idea. One of the big considerations there is that you are tra- if the property is financed, that might that might cause some problems. Bank, they don't like you to transfer title uh, when they've given you money to right against that asset. Okay, so. well, well, that that's really good news. So whether you own a property in an LLC or you own it individually, you're going to be able to get this this really good benefit, which I yeah. think is awesome. Uh, yeah, and, and an LLC, uh, um, you know, it, it, an LLC is it's a very ver- versatile uh, type of franchise. It could it could be a single member LLC, it can be a partnership, and you can actually uh, elect to have an LLC taxed as an S corp. So, um, yes. Uh, okay. You know. Now I, I've read a, a lot about bonus depreciation and I, mm-hmm. I'm not clear if that applies to us or if that is just for businesses that are buying equipment. Would, yeah. would that bonus depreciation apply to rental property owners? Is there any benefit for us there? Um, the I would say the general answer again was, is probably not. Okay. Um, just kind of I'll, I'll give you a little background on the bonus depreciation. Um, bonus depreciation it's it's one of these tools that uh, Washington really likes to use to incentivize business owners to spend and to buy. And so, uh, you know, I, typically when a business owner has to buy some equipment. Um, they have to capitalize that equipment and then write it off over whatever that uh, that the asset life of that that piece of equipment is. Uh, with bonus depreciation, historically, what you've been able to do is actually take a fifty percent uh, deduction in the year that you you purchase the equipment. And um, with this new legislation, what they what they've actually done is they've stepped it up to. A hundred percent deduction. Um, now, that's the good news. Uh, the bad news is that bonus depreciation usually only applies to assets that have a class life of twenty years or less. So, as far as uh, you know, buying a residential rental property, 
that gets depreciated over the 27 and a half years and then commercial property over the 39 years. Um, so those, uh, those class asset lives are beyond the, the bonus depreciation, uh, threshold. So you, unfortunately you cannot buy a, uh, uh, rental property and then write off 50% of the cost in the, in the year that you purchase it. Okay. Um, but the, this bonus depreciation, it, it can help, you know, perhaps other people that work in real estate. If you have a property management company or you're a realtor or so forth, and you do end up buying equipment um, and other furnishings for your office and, and so forth. Um, and so for the next few years, it is going to be at 100%, and then it steps down from there. Um, and eventually, it's it's set to eliminate uh, again, this a bonus depreciation is one of these things where they just they want to incentivize business owners. It's not a not a permanent uh, okay. part of the tax code. Uh, let's go back to the qualified business income. I, I saw sure. something in there about some income limits, uh, or the like. It was two and a half percent of the value of the house, or three hundred and fifteen thousand dollars. Can you explain exactly what that sure. means? Yes. So um, this qualified uh, business income deduction for pass-through entities, um, <clears throat> there is ultimately a cap, an income ta- cap on uh, on claiming this, and the, the, the cap is around uh, 315000 um, for a married filing joint couple and 157000 for an individual filer. Okay. Um, so if you make over that amount, that that twenty percent deduction we were talking about earlier, that doesn't apply anymore. You, you lose well, that deduction. Uh, it, well, it starts phasing out. Okay. There's there's okay. sort of there's there's this phase out range, um, and then there's other other things at play, um, and part of it is when you when you own a uh, a business. You wear two hats. You're the you know you're the shareholder, the you know, the partner in the business. But then you can also oftentimes uh, be an employee and receive W two wages. And so there are some caps on um, claiming this this qualified business income. Um, and ba- basically, what they want to do is prevent people from from gaming the uh, this deduction by you know running amounts through their their payroll. Um, versus taking it as a as a distribution from the pass through entity, and so there are uh, there are actually these these other limitations that come into effect. Uh, it's fifty percent of W two wages, and then there's also another qualifier. It's twenty five percent of W two wages and two point five percent of um, unadjusted basis on qualified property. It's um, <laughs> so this stuff does get complicated is what you're yeah. saying. So you want to make sure that you have a really good CPA that understands the stuff and can do it for you. So, so yeah, that's, I, yeah, I don't want to get too much in the weeds there, but, uh, right. but yeah, definitely talk to your CPA about this. And I, I think that's the whole point of this conversation is just to, to make you a little bit smarter so that you can have a better conversation with your CPA. Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. The next thing I wanted to ask you about is the 1031 exchange. Um, there was talk of that going away, but I believe that made it into the bill, but it mm-hmm. only applies to real estate now. Like you, you can't do a 1031 exchange for anything else but real estate. Right. So um, there used to be other cla- uh, asset live. For, this is my understanding. Uh, mm-hmm. Is that there? There were other uh, assets with different class lives that you could, you know, uh, do ten thirty one exchanges on, um, and so those those have been removed. But as far as doing ten thirty one exchanges on real estate, that that is still in play. Awesome. Um, yeah, how it affects the other class lives, I, I'm not sure yet. I'm okay. still, still researching that. Awesome. Well, Sean, thank you so much. This has been, um, I, I think, really good. I, I know I've, I've picked up a lot of really good gems from talking to you. I really appreciate you uh, taking some time during your, your busy season to, to come on and talk to us for a little bit. If someone is looking for a good CPA and they, they want to reach out to you, what's the best way for someone to get in touch with you? Sure. Um, it, Probably one of the best ways to look me up on LinkedIn or 
uh, you can always just reach out via email. Uh, my email is smacknamara at uh, welker, W-E-L-K-E-R, uh, C-P-A, C-P-A-S dot com. Um, and so if you have a lot of questions about this this new legislation, uh, don't email me right now. Email me in, in June <laughs> yeah, or beyond. Uh, I'll, I'll have a better idea of what all is going on then. Awesome. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure you're going to be, pre- be pretty busy here. So, yeah, please <laughs> please take it easy yeah. on Sean. But if you need someone to do your taxes, Sean is is definitely a great guy to reach out to. Um, and, and if you missed his contact information, I'll go ahead and put it on the website. You can find it at rentalincomepodcast.com slash episode 139. Well, Sean, thank you so much for coming on the show. And and we'll, we'll have to have you come back on here maybe in a few months when um, maybe some – things have been updated or there's some more clarification sure. on some of these points. Yeah, I'd so, love to. That'd be great. 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 Well, well, thanks a lot. And thank you for listening. My name is Dan Lane and this has been the rental income podcast.